It says that a healthy democracy is a transparent democracy. A healthy democracy is a transparent democracy. There's an approach to political questions that the conservative in me rebels against. Let's call it the, you can't have too much of a good thing fallacy. Virtually every popular idea in American life has cheerleaders for this fallacy. You've surely heard someone say something like, the only cure to the problems with free speech is more speech. One of my favorites is this idea that transparency is always good because sunlight is the best disinfectant. But sometimes you actually need to do things away from cameras because you can't negotiate things in public and having everything done out in public makes everybody lock in to their positions. Anyway, broadly speaking, I, I take the opposing view on nearly all such claims. This doesn't mean I oppose free speech or diversity any more than I oppose cheesecake or scotch. Rather, I subscribe to the view that life, and especially politics, is full of trade-offs. Our 50-year-old experiment with democratizing candidate selection, the primary system as we know it today, has gone awry. Last week on CNN, I made what I thought was a fairly conventional point about how the rise in small donors has had a distorting effect on democracy. And now small donors are actually one of the biggest problems for democracy, for the GOP, because um, small donor, large donors actually have a strategic view about moderation, who can win, who can't. Small donors really are just venting their spleen with yep. their credit card. And, um, and they lock candidates into positions that can hurt them in the general election. When I made such arguments, they were usually well-received on the right and absolutely loathed on the left. And the fact that he got away with saying that on a panel of ostensibly liberal, left-oriented, Oh, he was not challenged whatsoever. In fact, the host says, that is so point. brilliant, I would like to hear more about that. <laughs> They're still mostly loathed on the left. But in this populist age, they're increasingly despised on the right, too. Candidates who depend on small donors tend to take more polarizing positions. In part because they don't care much about electability, they push their party to more extreme stances, making the party brand less appealing to moderates. Such observations are not particularly controversial among experts. For example, election expert Richard Pildes writes, quote, one of the most robust findings in the empirical campaign finance literature is that individual donors are the most ideological and polarizing sources of money flowing to campaigns. Democrats routinely waste millions on ideologically blue state candidates in red states. Beto O'Rourke in Texas, Amy McGrath in Kentucky, who then pander to the views of liberal out-of-state donors rather than the more conservative but persuadable in-state voters. Great to have a million small donors from New York and California, but you actually need voters in places like Kentucky or Texas, and they don't want to hear what's pleasing to the ears of rabidly partisan people out of state. On the right, small donations tend to flow to candidates and grifters vowing to wage war on the mythologically all-powerful establishment. After she lost her bid for Arizona governor, Carrie Lake raked in $2.5 million, 80% of which came from out of state. She promised to spend the money on court challenges for her quote-unquote stolen election, but barely spent $1 for every $10 on that effort. As uncontroversial as this is in the real world, it's now heresy on certain quarters of the right, particularly among those who make a living trying to keep small donors angry enough to provide a credit card number. For instance, in response to my CNN comments, Senator J.D. Vance from Ohio claimed that I'm just angry at that the fat cats I allegedly depend on have lost their influence in politics. <laughs> I laughed. And not just because Vance's candidacy was launched with a $10 million gift from billionaire former boss Peter Thiel, but also because last year, the now newly pro-Trump Vance, he used to be a big Trump critic, insisted that the GOP's red wave failed to materialize not because of Trump's meddling or Trump's pernicious influence on the party, but because of the baleful power of Democratic small donors. A common refrain among my dyspeptic critics, and I got swarmed on Twitter like you wouldn't believe, is that small donors are enriching democracy by participating in it. They're just great citizens. Obviously, this is true for plenty of individual small donors. But it leaves out the fact that at scale, they cut out the parties. The parties are supposed to be these things that care about the overall brand for the Democrats or the Republicans, you know, either one across the whole country, right? Because they want to be competitive in all 50 states. But when you 
rely entirely on small donors, that kind of intervention, that kind of brand maintenance is completely cut out of the process and disproportionately rewards performative rabble rousers on the left and the right. This monetization of fear and outrage is a big business. Most Americans don't vote in primaries. Most Americans don't religiously watch cable news or make small donations. But the tiny slice of Americans who do all three have captured the primary process. And because most candidates worry about primary challenges more than general election ones, this sliver has outsized influence over politics in general. I'm not for banning small donors, but if you think polarization is a problem for democracy, then it's hard for me to see how they're not part of it.